Okay, everyone, welcome back. Um, today we're going to get into the last of our seed plants. These are the angiosperms, or the flowering plants. So remember how I told you that gymnosperms, you could remember because the ancient Greeks would play sports in the gymnasium naked, and that's what gymnosperms means, naked seeds. How do you remember angiosperms? Well, <clears throat> angiosperms produce flowers, and I always like to think um, your mom, Angie, likes to get flowers, okay? Or your girlfriend or your friend, Angie, likes to get flowers. And so that kind of helps me. Um, maybe it'll help you, maybe not, maybe it's stupid, but that's how I do it. And let's get into the angiosperms today. Angiosperms are extremely dominant, right? We, we already talked about the seed plants being able to um, get away from water sources, be able to spread far and wide through their seeds. Um, but the flowering plants, even more so. There's 260,000 species of angiosperms. That's second only to the insects on Earth. Their success is attributed to their flowers and their fruit. We'll talk about both of those today. Flowers allow plants to form evolutionary relationships with animals. The animals help them disperse their pollen to the female gametophytes. Fruit protect the developing embryo and serve as an agent of dispersal as well. So here are some flowers. Um, have you ever wondered, or maybe you've you, you know ne never never thought this before? What are flowers for? Well, they are they are specifically colored and they smell good for a reason to attract pollinators, whether that be insects, birds, other animals. The, the flowers want to attract an organism to come near it, either get some um, nectar from it or uh, just come in and, and smell it or possibly try to eat it and get some pollen to rub off on that organism and then have that organism go and visit another flower so that pollen can go and visit the female uh, gametophyte. And so um, that's what flowers are about. Of course, flowers come in different shapes and different types, and we'll talk about that, and we'll talk about the parts of the flower. Um, but flowers are awesome, right? Who doesn't like flowers? This is my favorite flower. This is called the Birds of Paradise flower. Really, really interesting looking flower. Um, we used to have one in my old school, and it bloomed a lot, and it was just really, really beautiful. So that's my favorite one. Uh, who knows, maybe you let me know your favorite flower. Let's keep going. Um, let's talk about the flowers. So, although they vary greatly in appearance, all flowers contain the same structures. Sepals, petals, pistils, and stamens. And let's talk about all of those. So the sepals are uh, the, the little leaves, basically, on the bottom. Uh, if you look at all of them, the whorl of sepals is called the calyx. And the calyx or is the whorl of sepals, all the sepals. It's located at the base of the peduncle or stem and then closes the floral bud before it opens. So when you see flowers about to bloom and they're covered by the green part, the green leaves basically, those are the sepals. If you look at all of the sepals, it's called the calyx, okay? Um, sepals are usually photosynthetic because they're green and although there are some exceptions in which they're not. Then the petals, pretty self-explanatory here. Um, they're collectively called the corolla, and they're located inside the whorl of sepals, and they usually display vivid colors and to attract pollinators. Flowers that are pollinated by wind are usually small and dull because there's no need to attract pollinators. The sexual organs of the flower are located at the center of the flower. The first is the pistil or carpel. So one unfortunate thing is that the same structure in flowers is given multiple names. So here is the pistil or the carpal, same thing. The stigma, style, and ovary constitute the female organ, which is called the carpal or the pistil. They're the same term. Um, but so let's take a look. Here is the ovary. Here is the style, and here is the stigma. And this entire thing is the carpal or the pistil. It's a long, thin structure called a style, leads from the sticky stigma where pollen is deposited, and that pollen tube would grow down the style into the ovary, which is enclosed in the carpal. 
Okay, and now let's talk about the stamen or the male reproductive organs. They um, surround the carpal. So here's the carpal or the pistil, and here is the stamens. Stamens are composed of a thin stalk-like filament, that's right here, and a sac-like structure called the anther, in which the microspores are produced. By the way, what are the microspores? The pollen. They're produced and by meiosis develop into the pollen grains. The filament supports the anther. Filament, anther, overall it's called the stamen. Okay, so that's the flowers. A little bit about flower structure. Now what about fruit? The seed eventually forms into an ovary. For, sorry, forms in an ovary, doesn't form into an ovary, um, and it enlarges as the seed grows. As the seed develops, the walls of the ovary also thicken and form the fruit. Many foods that are commonly called vegetables are actually fruit. Eggplants, zucchini, string beans, bell peppers, uh, the, the classic one is tomatoes. Um, you, you, you know, you would commonly think of these as vegetables, but they're actually fruit because they contain seeds and are derived from the thick ovary tissue. Acorns and winged maple keys, whose scientific name is a Samara, those are also fruits. So um, I don't recommend putting them in your fruit salads. Uh, who knows, maybe some of you would, would like that. Uh, I would, I tend to stray away. Uh, but they are actually fruits, so interestingly, they are. Uh, let's talk more about fruit. Mature fruit can be described as fleshy or dry. Fleshy fruit include the familiar berries, peaches, apples, grapes, tomatoes. But rice, wheat, and nuts are actually fruit, and they're examples of dry fruit. Another distinction is that not all fruits are derived from the ovary. Some fruits are derived from separate ovaries in a single flower, such as the raspberry. Interesting. Other fruits, like the pineapple, form from clusters of flowers. And additionally, some fruits, like watermelon and orange, have coverings, these tough coverings, called rinds. Regardless of how they're formed, though, fruits are an agent of dispersal. The variety of shapes and characteristics reflect the mode of dispersal. So if you're a light, dry fruit of trees, and like dandelions and other trees, like the Samaras, the little helicopter things, those are carried by the wind. Floating coconuts are transported away by water. Some fruits, though, are colored, perfumed, smell really good, uh, taste sweet, and they're very nutritious. And that is in order to attract herbivores that eat the fruit and disperse the tough seeds that go undigested and in their feces. They poop them out somewhere else, and that gets the seed to move through time and space. Other fruits have burrs and hooks that can cling to fur and hitch ride on animals. So uh, you ever step in a sand burr, um, you, you know what I'm talking about. It's very unfortunate and hard to get off of your shoe or unfortunately if it's in your skin uh, hurts quite a bit but that's the the mode of dispersal okay this is um going to get into some more uh higher level terminology here it's the life cycle of an angiosperm uh, but stick with me and and we'll get through it so the sporophyte phase remember the sporophyte is what the diploid or the haploid well it's the haploid phase and it's the main phase in an angiosperm's life cycle like gymnosperms, angiosperms are heterosporous. What does that mean? They produce a male and a female. They produce microspores, the male, develops in the pollen grains, which are the male gametophytes, and megaspores, which form an ovule containing the female gametophytes. Inside the anthers, microsporangia, which are the male microsporocytes, divide by meiosis, generating the haploid microspores that undergo mitosis and give rise to pollen grains. Each pollen grain contains two cells, the generative cell that will divide into two sperm and a second cell that will become the pollen tube. In the ovules, the female gametophyte is produced when a megasporocyte undergoes meiosis to produce four haploid megaspores. One of these is larger than the other and undergoes mitosis to form the female gametophyte or embryo sac. When the pollen grain sticks on to a bee, let's say, of one flower, from one flower, the bee goes to another flower, rubs that pollen grain off onto the stigma. The pollen tube extends from the grain, 
grows down the style and enters through an opening in the integuments of the ovule. The two sperm cells are deposited into the embryo sac. What occurs next is called double fertilization. And this is unique to angiosperms. Okay, it doesn't happen in gymnosperms, doesn't happen in the seedless plants. Um, it, is, it is unique to angiosperms. One sperm and the egg combine, and that forms a diploid zygote, which is the future embryo. The other sperm fuses with this diploid nucleus that was formed earlier in the center of the embryo sac. Now, if you have a diploid nucleus forming with a haploid sperm, you get this triploid, right, three sets of chromosomes. Um, and that forms a cell that will develop into what's called the endosperm. And that endosperm is a tissue that serves as a food reserve for the embryo. Okay, no, that was a lot there. But like I said, try to make some flashcards with those bolded terms. As always, email me. Uh, if you have any questions. Okay, let's talk about flowers. There's, there's two different types. Monoecious flowers over here, they have both the male and the female parts on the same flower. They're called perfect flowers for that reason. They have both parts, okay? Dioecious flowers have separate male and female flowers. So there's, remember dioecious was like sexual, uh, um, sexual activity, having a male and a female. And then monoecious was like when you had both parts and you were hermaphroditic. Well, it's kind of the same thing here. There's male and female parts in the same flower. On monoecious, on dioecious, there's separate male and female parts. Um, now, even though there are male and female parts on the same flower in monoecious flowers, there are ways in which they prevent themselves from self-pollinating, and which would be inbreeding, um, a number of different ways that I, 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 we won't necessarily get into. Um, so that's, that's gonna be it for this lecture. I want to remind you to start studying for the plants exam. I will post a review sheet for this one um, because you know there's, there's a little bit of higher language and just some stuff that's kind of difficult. And I will say, if you can answer all the questions on the review sheet, you should do very well on the exam. Good luck. Please send me emails or questions or message me um, in the group chat if you've got any questions about the exam, and I'll see you in the next one.